way through. Well, the first one is that Nancy Hale is both a novelist and a biographer. So she was writing about 70 years after the death of Mary Cassatt. And she was using a lot of Victorian style letters from the artist to her friends to help inform her perspective on how to write this book and how to bring alive these characters because there are very few people who she could interview who are still alive, who knew them personally. And of course, at that time, there were fewer photographs, no videos, very few records of these personas. Luckily, the late Victorians lived in a very um, epistolary life where they were writing letters constantly to each other. Mary Cassatt lived between 1844 and 1926, so that was a time of a lot of letter writing. There was a lot of international exchange, especially between continental Europe and the US. Um, I was curious that the biographer would use a lot of narrative literary terms that were either unusual vocabulary for me to hear or she was kind of reaching outside the box for descriptions or adjectives that are not commonly known. Um, I live in a, in a country where English is not one of the top three legal languages of the country, so I don't hear a lot of secondary vocabulary very often um, in everyday speech especially vocabulary that has uh, very literary tones to it. So I just wanted to share some of the unusual language that Nancy Hale was writing with. And maybe it's indicative of the time, you know, she was um, writing what in the early 70s and maybe she felt that her work would be elevated by using such unusual language. But let's see, so the first one's on Page 235. Here it is. So in the, on this page, she's talking about the artist in Egypt. And she said, the artist in Egypt can constituted just one more labourer, toiling like the others in age-old servitude. We know from the tomb inscriptions names of hundreds of kings, priests, warriors, administrators. We do not know the name of a single artist, even though it was the artist who passed on to us everything we know of Egypt and of Egypt's thought. His were unsigned statements, the priestly philosophers' great illuminations, the beauty with which they are expressed. These come not from priest or philosopher, but from the artist, unequipped with intellect, equipped with instinct alone. The artist saw, while the priest only cerebrated. And that was another dichotomy, not just in her language, the use of the word cerebrated, but she was often, Nancy Hale, the biographer, often comparing artists with other humans. And I know, <laughs> I know in her earlier biography of her own life, her autobiography, she described her parents who were both artists. So maybe she's just making this idea of artist as other into something very other because it's the perspective of a child towards their parents. It's all very othering. What's another one? Uh, 284. This is about the moment that Marie Cassatt died. At eight o'clock in the evening, her last breath was drawn in Armand Delaporte's arms in the present of Marta Bologna. Eight o'clock of a June evening. Oevchoisen, I think is the name of where she lived, would have been bathed in evening light, its birds flying low in brooding scallops, its insects turning a summer threnody. Can you see what I mean about this use of language which is incredibly poetic 
and really unusual for a biographer. I'm really enjoying threnody, cerebrated. This is the kind of language I'm not coming across very often. And here's another one that I really liked. Uh, not because the language is very unusual, but because I've had this own thought myself. I stood staring into the water, watching the wild watercress as it swayed in the current on this and on that, the other side of the stream. Something about the great tree leaning over the water, the zigzag fence, something about the birds mounting into the sky. It came to me that what haunted my fancy was a pattern on a blue willow plate. Not any debased modern dish, but one of those that English classmen, craftsmen at Old Staffordshire originally bought, like Marie Cassatt, her aquatints, out of a purely oriental conception. I was contained in the living landscape of just such a willow plate. This was the pattern of my surroundings. And this, the pattern my surroundings were cast in, this was the pattern of Marie Mary Cassatt's life. Sorry, I didn't read that super clearly. I don't even know whether to say Mary or Marie or Cassatt, Cassatt. Um, but I appreciated that as a non-artist, the author is familiar with those blue willow plates and could recognize that the landscape of the home that Mary Cassatt lived in was reminiscent of that exact aesthetic experience. So it helps inform on a deeper level the choices that the artist Mary Cassatt made in her own art because she was surrounded by a certain type of art that we consider maybe saturated nowadays. Maybe because it doesn't have an edge to it anymore. Those Dutch plates, those blue willow plates, they're too beautiful. They're not provocative. So I feel as though these little details that the author brought forward of the landscape being reminiscent of this aesthetic movement, it helps inform the way I engage now as a new viewer to Mary Cassatt's paintings. Um, another dichotomy that I wanted to bring up was this idea of training versus no training in an artist. 